I want to welcome everybody from uh, from wherever you are, and uh, we're going to do our best to give you a uh, stimulating discussion today. But first, I want to introduce my uh, guests, Carla and Kirk Reeder. And uh, Kirk was a pitcher for the San Francisco Giants, uh, who retired a couple of years ago. And I'd like to start with a question, Kirk. Do you ever get uh, nervous when you had to pitch? Uh, I got nervous all the time. So uh, it was something that I had to get used to, and uh, it was hard for me at first. But, I mean, I I just kind of took it as I had to do it and uh, something I had to work myself through. And, you know, that's kind of the thing I try to do with my daughter now uh, with a little bit of your help to relate it into sports terms uh, because that's what I feel I'm better at uh, relating to her in and uh you know, I, I've had bad games, I've had good games, and, uh, you know, I think I, I don't know if many of the people, if they're sports fans, but I gave up seven runs and got one out uh, in one of my starts uh, as a pitcher, so that's not very good. And, you know, when my daughter has some trouble with something or uh, I try to relate that back and, you know, you just get back up and, you know, go and try and get better and, and remember what that feeling was like. Uh, so that you try not to let it happen again. And okay, I remember asking you that. Did you ever have a bad game? And you told me that story, and I said, so how do you deal with it? And you said, um, well, I have to pitch every fifth game, so what I focus on is what do I have to do to be better next time? Yeah, and, you know, you, I think if anybody has something in their life that, you know, you know when you feel good and you know when you feel bad, uh, that, you know, you don't want that feeling again if it's it's bad. <laughs> And so you try and do everything you can to to prevent that from happening again and, and work hard. And, you know, I think it, it does relate a little bit, you know, like I said, with, with, with our daughter. I try and do that if she's having a hard time because I do believe, you know, she knows when she's happy and she knows when, when she's sad. And, you know, I try and tell her that, you know, you know, hey, if you feel happy one time, you remember, you know, what you did. And, and if you feel sad or, or something happened, you know, in between, you know, try and fix your, your mind to not let that happen again. And and the way you said it, it, it really is the perfect winning psychology when you think of it, and it's important to ask the question, what would inhibit a person from investing in that psychology, which is so perfect and so simplistic? And the answer is self-esteem, which is not healthy, and too excessive an internal critical script, which brings us to the subject of selective mutism. And I want to start here. I want to continue for a moment, and I just want to give uh, uh, 30 seconds of my resume because I know that uh, people have a very short attention span. My bio is uh, in-depth on the uh, website at socialanxiety.com. But here's the reality. Since 1978, I have worked with about 10,000 people of all ages who have had social anxiety and countless numbers of individuals who have had selective mutism. So the content that I'm going to share with you comes from that experience uh, and my work since 1978. And by the way, in addition to the people who are sharing tonight, there are lots of interviews which probably are one of a kind at socialanxiety.com where you can listen to families and uh, people who have gone through the process and who have resolved the problem. And these interviews are not only testimonials, but if you listen very carefully, you will get insight into the problem and uh, insight as to how it was turned around. So I'm going to give you a two-minute rundown on selective mutism. Then I'm going to turn this over to the quarterback here, who is uh, Carla, the uh, wife of the pitcher. Anyway, <laughs> selective mutism, you all identify it as your kids uh, don't talk. The not talking is the tip of the iceberg. It was not the iceberg that sank the Titanic. It was everything underneath. So what we're talking about underneath here is a complex integration of attitude, thinking, emotion, physiology, and family dynamics. And for people who are thinking, hey, my kid just doesn't talk, and you know, I need a little simple trick to turn this around, um, you're headed in the wrong direction when you're thinking like that. Selective mutism, and I don't think you're going to hear this anyplace else, but selective mutism is a variation of obsessive compulsive disorder. The obsessing is the conscious and not conscious thinking 
that the child of whatever age is doing. The compulsion is not to talk. There usually are other compulsions like the uh, disdain that the child of any age here um, has in talking about feelings. Selective mutism also can be considered an addiction to the avoidance of speaking. And I can assure you that not only is selective mutism um, uh, symptomatic of uh, uh, challenged self-esteem. Hi, are you guys there? Hello? I, I am. Yeah. Okay, because I just heard like a little weird little thing. Yeah, I, I did heard too, the yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we're testing this technology out for the first time here. Um, but it's, it's, um, it is severe social phobia, and for whatever it's worth, uh, the the number one phobia in the universe is uh, fear of public speaking, and selective mutism is certainly a precursor um, for that problem. Now, the most common question that I am asked is what type of therapy works for selective mutism. The answer is there is no classical type of general therapy that works. You've got to work with a therapist that first of all understands what the problem is and that's hard to even find. For example, uh, one of my families that I'm working with in Alabama recently went to their pediatrician and the pediatrician's response was, I don't believe there's anything like selective mutism. And that kind of response is pervasive. I have met very few pediatricians who understand or know about selective mutism and the typical thing is hey the kids just uh, oppositional or whatever not to mention it is very hard to find any school personnel or therapists who know what the problem is now what I want to do tonight my primary objective is to give you the basic issues and dynamics about how to turn this around so the type of therapy is teaching the parents to be the therapist. So I've had 50 people say, you know, uh, does play therapy work for the child? Well, you know, play therapy is a, is a good tool, but the learning curve is going to be just about non-existent in play therapy. You take the typical person with selective mutism to individual therapy, and 99% of the time it's going to be um, a waste of time, energy, and money. Let's start with diagnostics for a moment. If you know that your child can talk normally at home, but there is a pattern of not talking, not being verbal in specific venues, the most common of which is school, or to specific people, you have selective mutism. There really is no need to go out and spend thousands of dollars on uh, diagnostic tests. It is often important to know if there are underlying issues, any medical something, any uh, uh, learning disabilities like processing challenges or whatever. But the diagnosis of selective mutism is, is extremely simple. And the most common thing is, hey, you know, my child is very normal at home, um, but gee, they just don't talk in school. Well, you know what? Um, school is, is uh, the child's job. And if you don't talk in school, it's a serious problem. And the reason that the kids are not talking in school is because that's where performance pressure is, key word, just like Burke had to go out and uh, perform and pitch against the Cardinals and lots of other teams, everybody except my favorite team, which is uh, the Red Sox. <laughs> Got to have yeah. a little sense of humor here. Okay, now let's go through the steps of therapy. And by the way, for the people who are uh, uh, primarily interested in what to do with school, you're going to have to hang on because I can't tackle that until we go through um, some of the basic concepts. So, so be patient. Okay, so the first thing is that the parents have to be realistic and identify a problem. And then they've got to get on the same team. So, Carla, I'd like you to talk. There you go. You're 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 okay, on the pitches, I'm Matthew. On. I'd like I'd like you to talk about what was going on when your child was four, five, six, seven, okay. whatever. What you saw, what you were doing, what made you change your attitude, the first steps you took. Okay. Okay. Um, Hope has always always been shy um, from baby on, and that's how we labeled it. She's just shy. She's just shy. Um, Around age four, I guess, three or four when she entered preschool, I, as a mother, I knew she was a little bit different. I knew she wasn't just shy. I, I, I could sense it because just in public with anyone, family, anyone, 
she just would not talk, stone face expression, all of that. Um, she started preschool, and I could just see her with the other kids and how different. She would stand by herself, not talk to anyone. Um, it was really, really hard to, to watch, but it wasn't a major concern, I guess, until maybe I kept thinking, well, you know, I'm a stay-at-home mom. She's just She has to get used to it. She has to get used to being around all the other kids, you know. Well, I guess when she entered kindergarten, kindergarten was a tough year for her. Cried every day. The uh, teacher said she did not speak. She wouldn't talk at school. And, you know, I, I expressed my concerns to Kirk, who for probably up until she was around six or seven, kept saying, well, I was shy. I was shy as a kid. Kirk didn't talk in school for the first few years. And so I thought, well, I, I didn't buy that. I really didn't think she would grow out of it. And, and Kirk did seem to believe she would. And then I think it hit him more, you know, when she was in first, second grade, ages six and seven, and still at school events or school parties or anything, you could see the difference. All the kids were running around, playing, and hope, either set by me or Kirk, quiet, did not say a word. We'd get in the car to go home, and she was her usual chatty self. So, you know, it was a problem. So I initiated... Um, therapy i we took her to a therapist in um, nearby st louis and um, i could tell from the first session it was hope and i in session with her that it probably wasn't going to work um i felt like i knew more about selective mutism than the therapist did i mean i felt like i was guiding her she i but i wanted to give it a chance so i think we went for five months or so i um at that point, I remember feeling desperate. I remember feeling that hope was so different than the other kids, and it hurt me to see her so uncomfortable. Um, I don't, you know, I didn't want her to be the most popular kid or the most. I wanted her to be happy and comfortable, and I could tell she wasn't. Um, I mean, she was physically rigid. I mean, she would tense up. She would hold her hands in a tense position while in public the whole thing and um, it really it just hurt me to, to see that so um, I entered you know I got on the internet and I just looked up um, you know selective mutism some experts and the one I found was Jonathan and okay hold, now hold on okay okay now now okay so you come into therapy and um... she was at age seven when yeah I think she was about seven and a half when we started talking with you okay now um so one of the first things i said is uh uh mother and father have to be on the same team That's a right get it okay which you get guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay that was a good one. I, and by the way a couple of people asked me one person asked me a very good question um what happens if one parent uh, wants to get help and the other person uh, the other parent does not i will not ever accept working with a family where there is only one parent working, unless it's a single-parent family. Because what that is, is that from the get-go is sabotage, and it's fragmentation. And what we have to do to turn the situation around is be very impeccably organized and very coordinated, and fragmentation will breed the problem. And what happens usually is when there's one parent who doesn't want to get involved, they are illusional or delusional about the child will grow out of the problem, which is the biggest mistake in the world to make. Um, or they have their own issues um, and their own anxiety and their own guilt, and they don't want to deal with it. Okay? Uh, and I can, Oh, and by the way, he, here's the mind-blowing thing, and I don't know if you're aware of this statistic. Six out of 1,000 children have autism. Seven out of 1,000 children have selective mutism. Thank goodness there are so many programs in effect for the autistic community. There is hardly anything worldwide effectively for selective mutism which characterizes the confusion and insidious nature of this problem. Okay, so uh, Carla and Kirk uh, come to therapy, and we talk about parents have to be on the same team, and then I introduced the concept of non-enabling. Can you run with that a little bit, Carla? Oh yeah, that was that's the biggest the biggest thing up till now. Even um, the non-enabling. 
we, he just made us so aware of what we were doing as parents. Um, for instance, the, we enabled Hope the first seven years of her life. By far, she, we would speak for her. Um, we would make excuses for her. Um, you name it just to ease her comfort level. If we were out in public and, a, you know, not even a stranger, I mean, someone she knew could ask her a question, and she would just blank stare at them and not answer. So, you know, Kirk and I would answer for her right away. Or um, I would say, um, yeah, she's tired, you know, she's tired. You know, you can make up any excuse, any rationalization, and I did it. Um, because I just didn't understand, and I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable. And and in reality, it was my own. Okay, now, now, that. now. Okay, you. This is this is the key thing here. You did not want her to feel uncomfortable. You yes. wanted to nurture your child. You were. Def if I say anything wrong, correct me. Um, right. You were defining nurturing as, ma as making your child okay and relieving her from discomfort. Now, probably the most important thing that you could tell the other parents here is what did you have to do emotionally or attitudinally to shift into the belief that the right thing to do was not enabling? Um, well, the, the whole nurturing, I was confusing it with rescuing. I mean, I, you know, I would rescue her. Um, I, it was tough at first to not enable, but um, it's just awareness. It's awareness of of what you're doing and and it's amazing how much you do enable on a daily basis if you just if you're just conscious of it and aware um, yeah I mean I can you give an example of discomfort that you yourself as a parent had to work through in the process of learning how not to enable oh my um, well you know just the whole you you taught us the approach freeze the moment which means um, you know if someone did ask a question um, and instead of answering right away, I would count, you know, to 10 seconds, or or I would just stop and and look at Hope and let her answer. That was that was tough because and even when she 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 didn't answer at first, there were many times that you froze the moment and she didn't answer, right? Right. Oh, definitely. Okay. Can and you share how you had you worked that through in your head, the, the belief that you were doing the right thing? I knew I was doing. I mean, it's. Because it all makes sense. It all made sense to me when you explain it. Kids are creatures of habit. I mean, if the, if you're going to do that and let them, I mean, I taught her that I was going to be there all the time for her, and and I thought I was being the best mom in the world doing this. Um, she knew I was going to answer. She knew I was going to to be there to make it okay, and it was tough. I felt like she didn't understand why I was doing it, why I was making her feel uncomfortable. And it was tough at first, very tough at first, um, to do this because I knew she didn't understand. And, and I'm the type of person and mother that, you know, very nurturing, very want to help, want to do everything for you. And it was hard not to. But it's amazing how tough you can get um, if you know it's for your child's well-being. Okay, now I hold, mean, on, hold on for a second, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you're doing great, by the way. And I know okay. sometimes I'm asking some hard questions here. But anyway, oh, okay. um, non-enabling is not just not talking for the child. It is a multidimensional concept. What we, are, what we are talking about here is when parents have to go through the process of literally making a list of over-dependence, it's how does the parent overly think for the child, overly problem solve, um, uh, read the person's mind. Uh, one, uh, here's a typical example. Uh, one kid, six years old, uh, goes to school and the mother says, um, well, I carry the knapsack in every day. Wh why do you carry the knapsack in every day? Okay, well, why can't the child learn how to do that? Or, or the child, the, another six, seven-year-old, needs the parents upstairs all the time when she brushes her teeth at night. Well, well, why? Okay? N enabling is uh, defined as any behavior on the part of the caregivers that inhibits the growth or potential of the child. Now, we aren't talking about brain potential here. It's not just a, 
uh, an emotional, psychological thing. We're actually getting into brain physiology. You know, the example that I give of enabling, uh, my wife gave me a great present once. She gave me a sports watch. It's a really neat watch. But then twice a year, the time changes. And for the life of me, I don't want to spend 15 minutes going into the manual, racking my brain to figure out how to change this watch. So my stepson comes and does it in three seconds. Okay? <laughs> That's, I don't want to access that part of my brain. But when my stepson does it, it's not enabling because I have my life in order. So when the parents go through the process of non-enabling, not only are we changing the child's attitude and cognition uh, and emotion, we are literally changing brain physiology, I kid you not. Okay, now, so uh, Carl and Kirk went through this process, and by the way, it is a methodology, keyword. The worst thing that you could do is uh, get off of this conference tonight and stop talking for your kid uh, across the board. It has to be done methodically, 5% at a time. You need to develop the skills of reading the child's stress and helping the child process the stress. Okay, now we get into what is probably... Once you get past the whole attitudinal, emotional change that you have to do for non-enabling, then we get into what is a tremendously important technique and probably the most difficult of everything. And that is helping the dependent process emotions. In other words, I teach the parents. Remember, the parents are the therapists here. The individual therapists are never going to get to this, believe me. Okay, I teach the parents how to, to teach the child an emotional vocabulary. In other words, the key here is to attach, to attach and identify to the thinking, to attach and identify to the emotions. And this is what so many um, um, parents and professionals um, don't want to do. I mean, I remember one, uh, one couple where the therapy didn't work out and, and, and they were quite frankly angry at me with my whole approach and and the father says I don't want my child to think that there's anything wrong with her that she can't function in society so therefore they were never able to um, to teach the child you know about worry and anxiety um, and stuff like that and by the way when enabling takes place at home in school the child is learning a deeper problem they are learning a delusion a delusion means that the child is not in reality. They are learning that the world will adapt to them versus the other way around. That is a terribly um, profound problem. And the longer it goes, it becomes part of the personality, and it is uh, harder to resolve. So, Carla, could you talk a little bit about the process of, uh, as you said, my daughter is uh, the queen of I don't know. Yes. Um, just like you just mentioned, attaching an emotion to what she's feeling and name you know naming it she um oh boy yeah she she's very resistant with this and and now it is getting easier but um in the beginning when we began began doing this um for instance she come home from school after not talking all day at school and i'm sure being nervous worried anxious at school she would get home and just almost throw a fit basically just you know fighting with her sister just screaming almost a temper tantrum very out of character but it was always after school because she was clammed up for eight hours um you know i would get to her later and say okay hope what you know earlier what were you what was going on you know what were you feeling i don't know i you know it after about 30 i don't knows we would get to Oh, I was angry. I was mad. Well, you know, why are you mad? And it's like Jonathan said, it's just her, if she can just go through the process of thinking, I am mad. Okay, that's what I felt. I'm mad. Why was I mad? I was mad because, and anxious because I wanted to talk at school, and I felt nervous at school and uncomfortable at school all day. And then when I got home, I, I wasn't anymore, so it's that simple. I just let it out. And, um, you know, and now it's to the point where, um, you know, and, and then actually in the beginning she would get upset and she would cry when she would finally tell me the emotion that she was feeling. She would, you know, physically cry about it. 
now, um, then she went through a, a pattern where she was just getting annoyed with me. She was just, and you know, like Jonathan says, I don't do, I didn't do it every time. I would kind of pick my battles with her. I didn't want to be in her face about it every night. But if she'd have a moment, sometimes I'd give it a couple days. If I noticed that she, you know, if we were at a, a, a basketball game at school and a few of her friends from her class came up and said hi and, and she didn't say anything, I would later, you know, bring it up and say, Hope, you know, I noticed you know, this, and you didn't say hi, what was, what was going on, you know? Well, you know, after the initial I don't knows, she would just try to change the subject, you know? She was, she'd avoid, you know, try to avoid me. Oh, Mom, I'm tired. I Mother. The number of active participants in the conference at this time is 60. Two. The number of speakers in the conference at this time is two. You will now rejoin the conference. But she will finally say, you know what, I, I was quiet. I felt quiet, and I felt un uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say to them. I didn't know, you know, and so we talk about that. But very, you know, went through the emotions, the range of emotions, crying and uh, annoyed. She gets mad. Now she tries to avoid it when I talk to her. Um, but you know what, we do it, and we get it done. And it would be easy for a parent to say, oh, this is too tough. You know, gosh, I'm not even... I don't want to make, give, you know, she has, she had a hard enough time. Why am I making it any harder on her? But you have to, you know, and that's how I look at okay, it. Okay, and, 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 and key emotions are uh, frustration, worry, nervous, mm -hmm. proud, curious, frustrated, angry. What a lot of people don't understand is they, you know, they say my child is, uh, my child, is, you know, seems happy. You know, the person's talking to them, and they don't talk back, and, and they're smiling. I want you to understand that the smile is characteristic of detachment. Now, that is a very important concept to understand. The person with an anxiety disorder learns to detach. They don't want to think about the issues. They don't want to feel the feelings. They will do whatever they can do, and it becomes a very insidious reflex and the anxiety works its way into the personality over time and this detachment becomes the major thing that has to be dealt with um, and he, he, here's an example and, and just you know for the people who uh, you know think that uh, the people outgrow it uh, I, I've, I've got a lot of teenagers and adults that I work with not only with social anxiety but who have patterns of uh, selective mutism now one kid that I'm currently working with uh, who is age 16 until a few months ago, uh, never spoke in school. Um, during the initial uh, phase of therapy, uh, when he would come up with his parents to my office, he was so nervous that uh, he would have to literally hold on to the wall. He was so nervous, you know, walking up the steps. He can have a full conversation with me for, uh, for 30 minutes. Um, he just talked in school at age 16 uh, for the first time last month. But he's not talking in all the classes. And in school, we have things pretty well coordinated through the school psychologist. The teachers have to, uh, you know, fill in charts every week, you know, to be accountable. But here's what the kid says, and this is very important to understand. He says, um, I don't want to talk in school um, because uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to experience that difficult moment of talking because I don't want the kids to see me as being weird. Okay, now. I say to him, H how, how do you think they um, see you not talking in school? You don't think you have a reputation? Okay. That is a compulsion. That is a compulsion not to talk, not to deal with that moment of breaking the ice in school. Thank God he did it. Okay. Um, but uh, you, do you see the reasoning that is profoundly distorted? It only gets worse over time. Now, when you have an adolescent, who has selective mutism, um, you also, in addition to the anxiety and the mutism, you also have a developmental disability, meaning that all aspects, many aspects of the child's maturation have been affected. Now, many children, many dependents of all ages who have this problem are very smart intellectually, but their emotional and social intelligence is retarded.
at the risk of offending anybody. I'm not pulling any punches here today. It's very important that you understand the reality, okay? They can be very smart. I, I work with many brilliant people um, intellectually who, who have had substantial handicaps because of their performance and social anxiety. And here's a story. One, one, one guy uh, calls me four months ago. He's 42 years old. He calls me and says, you know, I have selective mutism. My wife came downstairs the other day, and she was talking to me. She wanted to talk to me. She was angry that my uh, my uh, uh, mother didn't send birthday cards, and uh, I didn't talk to her. I had the thoughts going round and round in my head. This is his direct quote. But I couldn't get them out, and she stormed upstairs. She was angry. And then he asked me a question. What, what, why do you think I waited so long to uh, get therapy? Well, okay, the wife threatened divorce because of the mutism. In fact, they are getting a divorce. The thing that you have to understand about mutism is it's a primitive, it's, it's symptomatic of primitive functioning, even if the child is very smart. Um, this person never would have gotten help if it were not for the external uh, influence of the wife. People, children and adolescents with selective mutism are not capable of initiative. That doesn't mean ability. Initiative means to start up. It's, in, it's impossible. They don't want to help themselves. They are not capable. So therefore, parents have two choices. They either uh, compensate for the child's lack of initiative and learn what to do, or they will unwittingly be enabling um, the problem. Carla, back to you now. Um, where are you at now? Can you describe where you're at now, where Hope is at now, and where you guys are at now as compared to when you started? Yes. Um, okay, when we started, Hope uh, was in second grade, was not, talk, was not speaking in school at all. Um, wouldn't raise her hand. Uh, she would not, it was so extreme, would not raise her hand to go to the bathroom. Did not want that attention on her. Um, she would wait until she got home to go to the bathroom. Um, she would have to bring her lunch every day to school because I guess she just didn't want to even, she thought ahead that if she didn't, she would have to maybe interact with the lunch lady or someone in line. I mean, she just avoided, she thought ahead and she avoided a lot in school. Um, she wouldn't go to other children's homes for play dates. Um, you know, if, if we had a play date, they would have to come to our home, and I would pretty much have to bring it along the whole time. She had a hard time even at our own home. Okay, now she speaks in school all the time. Her teachers say she raises her hand all the time, always um, volunteers. She, um, before, she wouldn't speak to me even in front of other people in public. Now she speaks openly to me in front of anyone. Um, she goes out to other children's homes on play dates and, and enjoys it and wants to. Um, she does fine. She, um, let's see, she... Um, today, we just, oh, yeah, had, tell a them your story we just today. had a good one today because I took her into a store just to, after school and... She, we were coming out, got in the car, and she was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I turned around, and she, like, had rolled down her window. It was just me and her, and she was yelling out the window to – there was a family on the other side of our car with a little girl that was in her brownie class, uh, her Girl, Girl Scouts. Scouts. And, I mean, she doesn't see her all the time in school, but she was yelling out and telling her hello, uh, and that's like a big step – that we're in right now is trying to get her to initiate and you know I was all you know came home and told Carla and you know that was that's kind of where we're at as far as you know we think her next big step is going to be where she gets so comfortable that you know she'll be able to talk and initiate just like she does at home. Right. On a scale of 1 to 10 um, with 10 being the best I measure everything 1 to 10 um, right. how optimistic are you guys presently? Optimistic for her for, for achieving continued progress and oh, given what you. Oh, I mean, I'm. I, I wouldn't be doing this if I would. I mean, you have to be as a parent. You have to to know it's going to work, and it's going to. You know, I know it will. So. And, yeah, right. If you do sustained 
hard work which you guys are doing and and you know some of the things I want to move to some other issues quickly because time is limited but you know some of the things that we worked on is the whole concept of um, you know the the paradoxical technique parents get used to uh, telling the child the answer but when you learn to freeze the moment and you do the techniques of putting the pressure on the child to process that's very important one of the things that you do is you don't pressure the child to talk you don't bribe the child uh, you don't plead with the child or beg because that will work in reverse the pathology which means disease will get worse and one of the things that you learned was to not enable but to be supportive and to nurture your child into the stress of reality with a matter of fact attitude okay now let's move into school here's the deal with school um, on a scale of 1 to 10 when the parents start therapy in terms of their learning th again this is the Jonathan Barron technique um, when they start for the sake of relativity they're at a 1 when they get to a 7 and everybody's learning curve is different. You know, people say, you know, how long does it take? I say, well, it depends upon the severity of the problem, the length of the problem, and the learning curve. Okay? I, I don't know a person's learning curve before I am working with them. Um, your learning curve is good. Not everybody's is. You know, some people can get to a seven on the learning curve, you know, with the non-enabling and the emotional management and the whole deal. Some people can get there in a couple of months. Some people never get there. But... When the when the when uh, the learning curve is approximately a seven, then we go into school. We try to go into school. Now here's the thing with school because it's complicated. Um, first of all, some schools are great. Some schools are just wonderful, and and the teachers are just wonderful, and the psychologists, and they really want to learn. And other schools basically say screw you. Okay, so um, that that is a very important variable but here here is the most complex thing because there's lots of uh, well-meaning well-intentioned teachers and speech therapists and social workers and whatever that say what can we do in school now you've got two choices as far as I'm concerned so listen very carefully number one is when the parents get I will never consult with the school unless I'm working intensively with the parents and they have to get to a seven because if you implement the techniques the non-enabling techniques the empowering techniques in the school before the child has been programmed at home it will be too much stress it will fragment the situation and it will make the situation worse in most cases there's always an exception to the rule so when the well-meaning teacher says what can I do in the classroom um, the basic thing is you either a invest in this uh, uh, therapeutic blueprint that we're talking about tonight or you accommodate now there's two types of accommodation there's positive and negative um, positive accommodation is understanding the special needs of the child and implementing um, the techniques and the strategies and the spin-offs of that that we're talking about today the other form listen carefully is making the classroom easier there is a there is an organization for example there is a doctor who will sell you uh, prepackaged uh, tape recordings so that when the child does not speak in school they'll push a button and the tape recorder will speak for the child that will accommodate the child that will accommodate the classroom and believe me, I understand that it's difficult. You know, a typical teacher has 20, 30 kids in the class. There's X amount of attention you can give to any one child, okay? That form of accommodation, while it will make the classroom scenario easier and uh, with less stress, will kill the mental health of the child because the child learns that they don't have to try and the world will adapt to them. It is as far as I'm concerned, extremely sick. And it is a guaranteed way to make the child more dependent. And over-dependence is a profound part of the problem. So there's a lot of things that teachers can do, but the parents have to get to that 70% mark for the child to be able to handle the stress of true non-enabling in the class. Now, one of the things that... Um, uh, the readers are talking about tonight 
is that when they're going through the therapeutic process, it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard. And there has to be the belief that there's going to be a payoff um, for doing the hard work. And when I do consult with uh, teachers, which I do all the time, the biggest mistake that teachers make is to say, okay, Jonathan is giving a strategy, so we're gonna, there should be a simple stimulus response thing. When I teach teachers how to do the, uh, the uh, freeze the moment technique and to not let the other kids uh, uh, talk to the child, which is very, you know, a common thing, um, they ought, they, the thing they need to understand, given the obsessive nature of the problem, keyword obsessive, is that they have to sustain their efforts. And sadly, many teachers burn out. You know, the world is not fair. Um, and this is an example of the world not being fair. But there is a right and wrong way to deal with this problem. There is another therapist uh, who, who has a technique where, let's say, they're teaching the child uh, to be verbal and they're, on, they're talking, uh, let's say the, the, the goal is to uh, have the child say the word apple. So they go, app, go app, and then pull very slowly. I think that's nonsense, okay? Because we, th this is not a speech disorder. We know the child can, can talk. What we're trying to do is we're trying to condition the child that they have to take the risk. And i got to tell you, you know, one of the key things for um, a lot of parents is when they get to the point that they take the kid to a restaurant. And some people listening will say, well, my child can speak at the restaurant, and that's very good. But many can't. Um, and so we take the child to the restaurant, and um, we tell them that if you're uh, not going to order verbally, you're not going to get the food. Now, don't try that now. If you're not working with me, don't try that tonight, okay? Please, I beg of you, because you're asking for trouble, okay? Because a lot of times they don't talk, and they get angry, okay? And the parents have to work through their own guilt or whatever. But so often, that is the turning point, because the anger is a good thing, because the parents have the opportunity to process that anger. But the parents got to be strong enough as a team to do that. Now, also, there are lots of things like, you know, in addition to IEPs and uh, 504 plans, and by the way, f for a more in-depth uh, information on school issues, um, there, there is another seminar that's available at my website for two and a half hours, and I have a lawyer talking about legal issues with school. Um, Carla, can you talk a little bit about um, how we intervene with school and what's currently going on there versus before? Yes. Um, at the beginning of this school year, Hope is uh, Hope was entering third grade, and um, Jonathan and uh, every we have. Well, first of all, we fortunately we Hope goes to a private um, Lutheran school, which there's nine kids in her whole class. She does share a class with the fourth grade, so there's another nine. So there's 18 kids in, in Hope's class, um, like 70 kids in the whole school. Very small, very, everyone knows everybody. It's very, it's a great, great atmosphere. The teachers, um, I'd say there were nine teachers, and that's including the principal, the pastor, everyone was there for this conference. Um, we, and Jonathan, we had, yeah, like I said, the conference at the beginning of the school year. We just wanted to get everybody on the same page. Um, it went great. I mean, the teachers, it was amazing how amazed the teachers were. They, most of them had never heard of selective mutism. Um, it, it, then they got to thinking back when they were in school, and they, you know, after the phone conversation, they would say, oh, I, you know what, I bet so-and-so had selective mutism. You know, and, and they were thinking back on people, and they were just intrigued. They were, it was very interesting to them. The, um, um, and Jonathan basically gave them techniques, as he did us as parents, on um, enabling. And, you know, because teachers, they unwillingly, yeah, they were uh, unknowingly doing it. They were doing it too enable before. as well. Because, of course, I mean, for instance, before, before our phone conversation, before the um, conference call, like, say, in kindergarten, first and second grade, um, they would let the other children speak for Hope, um, and, and the other kids took it upon themselves. It was almost like Hope was the, you know, the one, every, the baby that everyone took care of in the class, and they all, if, if somebody if had a question for Hope, 
somebody would answer for her, just by Hope's expressions, I guess. Um, and the teachers allowed it. The teachers wouldn't call on Hope because they knew she, you know, didn't didn't talk, didn't want to make her uncomfortable. Um, they would allow her not, for instance, on roll call, everyone had to say here. They didn't make Hope say that. You know, they would just check her off. Um, uh, in one in one example that wait, 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 it's me. not it's not that they didn't make her you can't make the kid but but it's the expectation ask. right okay they didn't ask her to talk right make ask that's what I yeah that's what I mean um, yeah because they, they knew she probably wouldn't so they avoided it you know they just didn't do it uh, one instance um, a teacher came up to me I hope was in second grade and she was so excited and said, um, you know, Carla, today at choir, Hope, because they knew, you know, I had talked to them, too, about how Hope was, you know, we'd always have conferences and, and how I was trying to get her to talk more. And she said, Carla, you know, um, Hope volunteered to do, to, to say this line or to start the song in choir today. And she said, you know, she went up there, and I said, that's great, Hope. Do you want you know, Jenna to come up and help you. And, you know, and she said, and Hope said, no, no, I'm, I can do it. Well, then I said, you know, that is great. I thank you for telling me that. But she, I mean, I don't, she didn't realize it at the time. And I, and I did tell her later, you know, that instance, that's great. But next time, don't ask her if she wants someone to come up with her. And don't treat, you know, she, she was still treating her differently, even when Hope was volunteering she still treated her like um you know like she couldn't do it herself had no confidence and and you know if you treat kids like that they're they're you know they'll do it and um you know and then another teacher for for example after we spoke after we started well okay that was before the conference okay now after the conference the teachers um and i and i've talked with she has one primary teacher and i've spoke with her since and she is very on board with the um, non-enabling and being consistent and um, asking hope questions, treating her the same as the other kids. Um, she's doing great. Um, one thing I had asked asked her, you know, if she was non, you know, the non-enabling, and she said, you know what, I'm doing great. And then I seen her a couple of days later, and she said, Carla, you know, I thought about it and. You know, I think I have been enabling in some ways because there's this thing where we have to uh, say something in class, and I and I don't make hope say it. I kind of skip over it. So you know, even it's it's amazing how many times in a day a teacher can accommodate or or can. It, you it's know. very it, it it it's very um, insidious. It, it, oh it, my! It's, it it becomes a reflex. But you know, let's just jump. I got we've got about ten more minutes here. Okay. okay. Uh, one of my patients yesterday, uh, 40 years old, Ph.D., brilliant guy. He's an economist. He teaches uh, other Ph.D.s. And um, he has been avoiding uh, presenting at professional conferences um, about work that he publishes. Now, I'm going to tell you, avoiding because of public speaking performance anxiety. Um, this person, just like another person today, one of my patients makes two million dollars. Um, he's involved in a, he's a major player in a hedge fund, and he's actually the go-to guy for public speaking and marketing. And uh, no one knows that he's got this underlying obsessive problem. Um, and making the two million dollars a year, he said to me a couple of weeks ago, Jonathan, I'm uh, I'm thinking of uh, leaving my job <laughs> in this economic climate. You know, it's mind blowing. Um, this is the obsessiveness underlying, and when it, 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 it gets a hold of the personality and the person is avoiding the things that they don't want to be or shouldn't be, I want you to understand something. The person is involved in self-loathing. They are hating themselves for doing it. And you may think that the young child is okay and happy, and you might think Jonathan's an alarmist here. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've seen more people with this kind of problem than anybody in this world. So I feel pretty confident telling you this. The self-loathing starts at an early age, and the child is angry at themselves, and they see the world going on, and they're not a part of it. They're not happy campers when that goes on. There's a silver lining here. Um, for a long time, 
uh, the average age of all of my patients was 27. The wonderful thing, thousands of patients, the wonderful thing when, when, when you have a four-year-old or a nine-year-old is that you, and you have willing parents, you can attack the anxiety productively before it becomes more a part of the personality. That is a crucial thing for you to understand. Um, quite frankly, when parents are motivated, re re relatively intelligent, have realistic expectations, and work as a team, um, I, I got to tell you, th there hasn't been situations that I have not had a relative degree of success. When I do not have success, it's because the parents are not willing to do the work. I mean, I've had plenty of people who the kid is 13 years old, 16 years old, and the parents uh, just cannot comprehend the concept of enabling. We're not going to get anywhere with that. One uh, issue that we did not talk about tonight that I'm going to give you 30 seconds on is the use of medicine. Going back to the 1 to 10 scale, when the parents get to a 7 with their uh, reparenting um, and the child is stuck, frozen because of the intensity of obsessiveness, um, we often use medicine. Fifty percent of my selectively mute uh, people use it. Fifty percent do not. It depends on, uh, you know, the, the customized needs. But when medicine is given as the primary uh, therapy, it is, uh, quite frankly, clinically criminal. Um, it is not going to solve the problem. Medicine is a specific tool to be used a specific way at a specific time for specific objectives for a specific length of time. And there is specific medicine that needs to be used. And I'm not going to get into that today because the last thing that I would want is people running out and, and using this medicine. However, on the other seminar that I mentioned that you can get at socialanxiety.com, there is a psychiatrist who uh, talks in depth about medicine. Um, resources for you if people want follow-up help. Obviously, um, the number one productive is, is uh, therapy. <laughs> one person... Uh, said, you know, uh, how can we do therapy over the telephone? My kid doesn't talk. <laughs> Obviously, they're not getting the issues here, okay? Um, it's the parents who learn to be the therapists, whether, you know, I have uh, uh, clients in, in Taiwan, in England. You know, all you need is a telephone and the right attitude. Therapy spaces are extremely limited. And quite frankly, um, before people decide to do therapy, they probably should invest in some of the self-help programs. The book, Beyond Shyness, you can get not only at my website, but at Simon & Schuster, and that gives you a, a holistic understanding of the problem. There is a self-help program for selective mutism and another seminar for selective mutism. There's lots of things available to you. Um, but you know what, uh, Carl and Kirk, I think you know this was almost an hour. And uh, I'm going to tape it. Obviously, I've been taping this, and I'm going to be putting this on the website for people to listen to. Uh, and I think you guys did great, and I thank you for your input. Are there any final words of wisdom that you can leave the audience with? Uh, I mean, I could say it, it is very tough, I mean, uh, to do. And, but like Jonathan said, if, if you stay the course and, and know what the reward is that you're aiming for, uh, I mean, I don't think anybody uh, is successful in life without going through tough times, and I think that's kind of the way we've taken on this uh, with with our daughter is, you know, we know there's going to be some tough times, but in the end, we're looking at the end result, and, you know, that's well, what we're shooting for. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, during the tough times, it's I feel like it's okay because I know I, I look down the road. and And as a parent, you just, you know, my turning point was here I'm looking at my daughter in second grade sitting alone at recess, you know, not playing when the other kids are playing or sitting alone at lunch. You know, fast forward that to eighth grade. If you do nothing, nothing's going to change. I mean, she's she'll be sitting alone, you know, by her locker in eighth grade, sitting alone at lunch in eighth grade. And you you don't want that regret as a parent. I mean, it's your job to take responsibility for them and um you know you're not going to be around forever you're you're hopefully going to outlive your children and you don't want your child to to be this dependent and this unhappy you know you don't want to have to worry about that when you're gone i don't so it's you know as a parent i i think it's the you know the only choice i mean i think it's a great thing to do and i'm very happy kirk and i are doing it jonathan's 
fantastic. Hey, guys. Um, thank you very, very much for sharing. Um, audience, I hope this has stimulated some uh, productive thinking for you guys. Um, again, you can tell people who are not able to uh, make the conference in a couple of days. I'll have this on my website. People can just listen to this whole interview. Kirk and, uh, Kirk and Carla, thank you very much, guys. I'm going to say you. I'm going to say welcome. good night and uh, go Red Sox, and I'll see you soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Take Jonathan. care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.